10 o'clock service. Please have a seat after a few notices for us all. Uh, after the service, there'll be refreshments at the back, so please do uh, avail yourselves of those. Um, as ever, we're trying to make the church safe for everyone and to feel safe, so please, um, you're welcome to wear a mask. The rules say you don't have to, but also space out as, as you uh, would like to so that you are happy uh, with those, yeah, managing your own uh, sense of safety and, and your own safety. But uh, we, will, we will try and support one another as we navigate these COVID rules. Um, parents, great to see you. Uh, we'll be having a meeting in the lounge at 11 o'clock uh, after the service. Probably enough time to grab a cup of tea or coffee afterwards, and then we'll need to chat about hopefully starting the Sunday school uh, in the next few weeks and months. Uh, talking back to tea and coffee, everything seems to circle around tea and coffee on these particular notices. Um, we'd love some help with the refreshments, um, Rita. So if you want to, I think at the back there is a sign up sheet. Um, if you think you can make a cup of tea, and give it to someone, maybe you should think about joining the refreshments rater. Um, just once a month, or once every couple of months. The more people are on it, the lighter the load for everyone. Uh, and then lastly, some bands of marriage. So I published the bands of marriage of David Charles Michael Barton, single and of the parish of St Michael upon Greenhill, Litchfield, and Clementine Rose Cousin, single and of this parish, and they're going to be getting married at All Saints Holbeach. And this is for the third time of asking. If any of you knows any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. And I published the bands of marriage of Charlie Martin Henry Thomas, single and of this parish, and Zoe Louise Meekin, single and of this parish, single and of St James Moulton, uh, single and of this parish, uh, getting married at St James Moulton Chapel. And I also published the bands of marriage of Nicholas Edward Sear single of this parish, and Danielle J. Dion, single of this parish, and getting married at St. Bottles, Boston. These are both for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why these various couples may not lawfully marry each other, you want to declare it now. And silence being one thing, let's pray for them and for our service, and for Reverend Pat as she serves the good people of St. Paul's. So Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for marriage, and we pray for these three couples, that you would unite them in an ever-deepening love, that you'd help them to lean on you as they go into married life together, that you'll prepare them and that you would make each of their marriages special and a blessing to them and a blessing to all that they encounter. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray for us here gathered. Father God, would you feed our souls? Would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us? Uh, would you... Uh, give us what we need uh, to live for you in the coming weeks. And we pray for Pat too. Would you give her the help of your Holy Spirit as she serves you and your people at St Paul's. So we commit all of us into your loving care. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do stand as we sing our first again, Lord of all.
So let us worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please sit. As we approach God, we ask for his help to live for him. Almighty God, we pray to you, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. And as we come to confess our sins, there may be something on your mind that you want to bring to God. Uh, know that as you bring it to him, Christ died for you, and forgiveness is freely available. Let's have a moment of silence, and then we'll say our confession to The scriptures say that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so we pray together. O oh God, our loving Father, we know that you forgive us when we turn to you. We ask you to forgive us for the wrong things we have done and the good things we have not done. We have forgotten to love you and we have forgotten to love one another. We are truly sorry. We turn again to you. Please help us to lead better lives every day. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So may the Father of all mercies wash away your sins and mine, and set us on fire with love for him, by his Spirit, and through his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as the forgiven people of God, we pray together. Lord of the hosts of heaven, our salvation and our strength, without you we are lost. Guard us from all that harms or hurts, and raise us when we fall. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We have our uh, Old Testament reading. This morning's reading is taken from Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Boaz, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimedech, and the name of his wife Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mona and Chilion. They were Aphrodites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there for about ten years, both Malon and Chilean also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. Then she started to return with the daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters in law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters in law, Go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. And she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought her was hope for me, 
Even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. All but kissed the mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Where your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned with Ruth the Mo Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the county of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing, 
yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. And when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And as we come to the sermon, let us pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us through your word, a word we need to hear because you know us and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I will very briefly touch on the Gospel reading, but mainly in the Ruth reading. Uh, today is the 70th anniversary of the Queen's accession to the throne after the death of her father. And this year there are lots and lots of royal celebrations planned to mark this platinum jubilee. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that even in this more democratic age, the royal family still has this ability to fascinate. And the Book of Ruth, that we'll be looking at for the rest of this month, has some royal connections too, as we'll find out. The Bible's interested in kings and queens, but one of the really nice things about Ruth is the main bulk of the book really is just about the ordinary people, about you and me. Um, it's not about the royal or the politically or financially significant. It's a book for everybody, the every man, the every woman, and how God isn't just interested in the powerful, but is interested in each one of us and relates to us. So let's have a look at what happens in Ruth. First of all, let's meet the cast. Um, who were they? Well, it's interesting, the way the book opens, it doesn't say there was a bloke called Elimelech and his wife Naomi. It says a certain man, and then his wife and two sons, as if to say they could be anyone. They could be you, they could be me. And then, only after that, do we learn their names. And if they're regular people, and I think that's one of the points that's being made, then whilst the people are regular, the times are difficult. So it's the time of the judges, uh, it's a time of lawlessness, a time of violence, a time where sparrows do what they want. <laughs> <laughs> Stay there. Um, it's, but it is, it's a dangerous time. Uh, if you want to read about it, read the end of the book of Judges. Um, Anyway, um, it's not just politically difficult and lawless, it's also difficult because food is scarce, people are hungry, and a bit like a pandemic or rising prices or whatever, it's widespread and it's pretty indiscriminate. And so what's a, what's a family with two young rabbits to feed going to do? Well, Elimelech and Naomi decide they'll up sticks and they'll try their hand at a new life in a new country and they move to Moab. And that sounds fair enough in Ireland, doesn't it? But there's more going on than just packing suitcases. Because Elimelech and his family are Israelites. They've been given this land by God. They're meant to therefore be in this land with God through thick and thin. Um, and this land that's been given to Elimelech is meant to be passed down through the generations. Yep. His children, their children, the children after that. There's meant to be this deep connection between God and people and land. But Elimelech and his family decide, well, they'd rather go it alone, away from God and without God, and try and carve out their own space in Moab. And I guess that highlights a choice that we face on a big scale and on a little scale, just lots of times in our lives, isn't it? When life is tough, or maybe when it isn't, will we turn from God, or will we turn to God? And what happens when trusting God is the hard thing to do, or feels like it's the hard thing to do? I guess so often the temptation is, well, if going with God looks hard, I'll, I'll find a more comfortable 
different way of doing things on my own. Over here, I'll, I'll move to Moab. And the question then is, well, can Moab deliver? Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabah, what Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpah, the name of the other was Ruth. And when they lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husbands. It doesn't mean that always when we turn away from God, things are automatically going to get terrible immediately, but it's a picture. Here it is. Naomi had a good ten years in Moab, but ultimately Moab didn't deliver, because we were all made to find life with God, like in God. Um, and so here we find a picture of walking away from life, walking away from God, and finding that when you cut yourself off from life, there is, there is death. But, that's not where the book ends, it would be a very short book if it is. With God, there's always hope. There's always hope. And so we get this little glimmer of hope, this rumour of hope, because she hears in Moab, that God has come back, the famine is over, and he's granted food to Israel. And so she set out from the place where she'd been living, she and her two, two daughters in law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. Now, one of the hard things about life for Naomi and Ruth and Orpah is that they're just really on their own. In that time, particularly because Judges is so dangerous, she really do want the protection um, of a man, whether it's a father or a husband or a son. And here they are, three widows, one older one, two younger ones, and what can they do? They're very, very vulnerable. And they face destitution because there aren't many lines of work open to women in those days. How are they going to get a crust to just keep alive? Now at this point, Naomi is very pragmatic. Um, maybe it was the pragmatism that led them to Moab in the first place. Uh, she sees the writing on the wall, potentially they face destitution, and so she thinks the best place for me is I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. And so she sets off with Ruth and Orpah in tow. But then along the way back to Bethlehem, maybe not very far along the way, she says this, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you've dealt with the dead and with me. You've done your duty by me. Don't feel you've got to stick with me any longer. Um, your Moabites, go back to all that you know and is familiar. Um, go back to your own families, they'll look after you, whereas what can I offer you? Maybe then you can get married and find other husbands. And so she prays a little prayer, the Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husbands. And so Naomi said, I'm going to Bethlehem, and Ruth and Orpah, they've got a choice. Which way? Go back to Moab, or follow with Naomi to a foreign land, to a land potentially of enemies, to Israel, <coughs> to Bethlehem. Now, if they go back to Moab, it's straightforward, isn't it? Back home to mum and dad, you know, cooked breakfast every morning, I don't know. It, it should be alright. If they go to Israel, because they've married into an Israelite family, things get a bit complicated. So you remember that deep connection between God and people and land? Well, <coughs> Elimelech's got an inheritance that is meant to be his and he's meant to pass on to the plan. There's no male to inherit that. And somehow between Naomi, Ruth and Orpah, if they all stick together, they need to come up with a male to inherit this land. Because it's got to be passed down then for the generations. But biology is not on their side. So the idea is that, you know, someone dies, a bloke who's going to inherit the land dies, well, his next oldest brother should marry his wife and with his wife have a son who can then take the eldest brother's place. Does that make sense? So the brother comes in and steps in and, and you know, he's a husband for a bit so that there can be an heir to inherit. So ideally, Naomi has more sons, Ruth and Orpah marry them, and somehow out of that lot there comes a son who can be an heir for a living. Okay, It's a bit complicated, but that's how the system is supposed to work. There is a problem. Biology is not on Naomi's side. What does she say, verse 12? Turn back, my daughters, go back to Noah, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. So, 
There's nothing in Noah. There's not a lot of prospects of a future in Israel either. So they're still in a pickle. Um, so they have a choice to make. Each of them. Orpah goes back to Noah. But Ruth doesn't. Ruth says this amazing little speech. She says to her mother in law, Don't press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. And Naomi's faith in the living God might have been quite lovely, which is why she went to her in the first place. But somehow, Ruth, through hanging out with Naomi and Elimech and all, this, and all the rest of them, has somehow discovered that the God of Israel, the Lord, is the real God. And she heads back to Bethlehem, not just clinging on to Naomi, but clinging on to Naomi's God. And they head back. And Naomi, well, she's not in the best place. She blames God for it all. Her name, Naomi, means pleasant or sweet. But then she pours out her heart in bitterness when she gets to Bethlehem. Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? And, well, I don't know, how would you feel if you were in Naomi's shoes? She went away with a happy young family. She comes back on her own. And from her perspective, tragedy has followed tragedy, and there seems to be no hope. And she feels empty, she says as much. And suffering can do that to us, can't it? Um, it can leave us feeling empty and angry and bitter and in despair. You know, we get angry at God and the world and other people and ourselves. But can I suggest that Naomi, as she focuses on all that upsets her, understandably, she's missing some things that I think could give us hope in our circumstances. So first of all, when we only look for bad news, bad news is all we see. So in her bitterness, she says she's got nothing, but she's got Ruth. She's got a daughter-in-law who's prepared to die with her and to stick with her through thick and thin. That's not nothing. When we're going through the mill, or even when we're not, maybe we need to say, Lord, please show me. Show me what it is uh, that you've also given me. Show me the good things that I can't see right now, so that I'm not left in the business. Second, um, there's always a note of hope with God, because you never know what it is he might be about to bring about. So, Mary and Ruth have very little between them, but they come to Bethlehem at the beginning of harvest. If Naomi feels she started the chapter full and it came back empty, with Bethlehem it's the other way around. Bethlehem was in famine. And now there's a great big barley harvest coming, as God has come to the rescue. And the scriptures then are full of encouragements to us sometimes. That sometimes what we need to do is just wait. Trust that God really is good. Bring our concerns and our worries to him in prayer. And then wait for him to act in goodness, because he will in his own good time. I think the third thing that Naomi's missed is the conversion of Ruth. So, Ruth would have been brought up worshipping a child sacrifice loving god in Moab called Chemosh. Truly a god of death. Um, but since getting to know Naomi, she's turned her back on that and has started worshipping the one true living god. What does that tell us? I think it tells us that there's room for everyone, isn't there? God's welcome is there for all of us when we turn to him, whether it's back to him or to him for the first time. You know, we might be a Ruth. Um, we've never known God, but through alcohol chatting to friends, we've started to recognise that he's real. And we wonder, well, will this God have me in his family? And the answer is yes, of course. You bet. Maybe we're a Naomi, and in little ways, or maybe in great big ways, we, we know we've known God, but we've wandered from him. Is there room for me, even with my bitterness, to come back to God? Absolutely. You bet. She's back in Bethlehem with the people of God in God's land.
there's a welcome there for you. We're always then invited to keep coming back to God from our mouths, whether they're big mouths or little mouths. In fact, it's not just about us wandering back. What was our gospel reading about? Jesus coming and saying, I'm going to get you guys together, and together we're going to fish for people and bring them all in to God's family, into his community, into his love, into his church. So I don't know where you are with God, but Ruth 1 says to all of us, it doesn't matter who we are, we might feel very ordinary, God has a place for us. It doesn't matter where we come from, we might feel like a foreigner, a Moabite, the sort of person that would be seen dead in a church. And God says, no, no, there's a place for you here. It doesn't matter what we've done. We might have made some very little mistakes. We might have made a complete hash for 10 years. With God, there is a welcome and a hope for And with God, we can turn to him and find mercy and forgiveness and life and welcome. And, hope. and in the book of Ruth, above all, we can find kindness from our God. So let's pray to him now. Lord, very simply, in our lives we need your kindness, and we pray you pour it out on us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. My God, she said to Naomi, let's confess our faith in God. Please stand. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. And please sit for our intercessions. Thank you, Lord, that as we reach out to the servants, you are at the heart of our endeavours. Thank you that when our support fails, you uphold. When our arms grow weary, you sustain. When our love wavers, you stay constant. May you serve with the love of Christ and bring comfort that comes from God. May we share burdens through the power of Christ and bring strength that comes from God. May we view others through the eyes of Christ and show compassion that comes from God. May we respond with the forbearance of Christ and show grace that comes from God. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church, for the clergy, great, soul, and pact. For the congregation and all who contribute to the well-being of our church. We pray for the ongoing of the Sunday School and the Little Steps Trophy. We give thanks for the availability of Bible study and prayer groups where we can be united and fellowship in the teaching of your holy word. We remember fellow Christians around the world who are unable to publicly worship you and live in fear for their lives. Protect them, Lord, and may they know that they are surrounded by your love. Lord, in your mercy. We remember the residents in care homes and the carers who look after them. As 
all the restrictions of the pandemic are being lifted, we give thanks that families will be able to visit their loved ones once more. We pray for the people of this town that they will look forward with hope and positivity to the future. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your creation of the world, which you have provided as our home. May we be more appreciative of these wonderful gifts. Help us to take more responsibility in taking care of our environment. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our Queen as she approaches her platinum jubilee. May we ever be thankful for the many years of loyalty and dedication to our country and its people. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Through these uncertain times, Lord, we pray for our government and all political parties. Let them put aside their differences and be united in the decision making for the benefit of our society. We pray for the homeless, lonely and anxious, for those whose family lives are going through difficult times. Surround them with the other and give them hope for the future. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We bring before you, Lord, all who are sick in mind, body, and spirit. We thank you, God, for the doctors, nurses, and all medical teams who tend to their physical needs. We pray especially for those on our prayers. Pamela and Robin, Arthur. Michael Johnson, Reverend David Hill, Caitlin, Helen, Helen Hartman, Anna Father, Victoria Smith, Kieran, Mark Bickle, Karen Hudson, BB, Margaret Rose, Ruth Wright, Gwen, Karen Buckler, Reverend Hilary Eastcote, and also for Andrew Graves, Eves Stanway, may they know that you are there with them in their darkest and worrying times. Lord, in your mercy. God bless those who are grieving for the loved ones who have departed this world. Comfort them in their hours of sorrow and despair. God bless the souls of Ada's Chapel, Lydian Miriam. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds to receive, to receive the love that you give us so free. Merciful Father, stand. We are the people of God who in his kindness has given us his peace. So the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of the Lord.
We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to the Lord. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your son. We rejoice as your children, and love the us to sit and be with you. In Christ, you shed our love, that we might live in him. He opened his arms of love on the cross and made the Lord the first sacrifice for sin. On the night that he betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
eternal lives to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for leading us to the body and birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we are to you our souls and lives to be a living sacrifice. Set us out to the power of your Spirit to live and work to your grace and glory. Amen. Please stand for our final prayer.
let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.